Well, welcome to a wine decoded winemaker session with Michael Dillon from Bindi Wines. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to just have a quick uh, quick chat about what's happened at Bindi over the last oh, I don't know since it started to now, and uh, and then uh, what's happening in the future. And I guess what I'm really interested in is uh, you know in Australia we've all we've started from from scratch. We've had to plant vineyards. We've had to get our head around whether the varieties in the right spot. We've had to get our head around making the wine. So, from the beginning till now, what do you what do you think have been the the big things that have happened and big things that have changed that have been important, or maybe even just a whole lot of little things? Well, if we go back to the beginning, we go back to 1975 when my father wanted to plant a vineyard and got an expert in who advised Dad that it was a totally inappropriate place to plant a vineyard and that he shouldn't pursue such a folly. So he didn't. So for 10 years he put that on the back burner and then in the mid-1980s the Masson Ranger Shire Council, or then it was the Gisborne Shire Council, wanted to encourage farmers to diversify what they were doing on their land because subdivision was a, a key thing in our area being so close to Melbourne rather than farming. So my father investigated further planting a vineyard with uh, Murray Clayton, the state viticulturalist, and he came back and said this is a fantastic vineyard site. The advice you got 10 years ago sounds completely ridiculous and you should plant Chardonnay and Pinot Noir because it's a cold area at 500 metres above sea level and if the fruit doesn't get ripe then you can make sparkling wine. So indeed in 1988 we planted a vineyard, 11 acres of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and since then we've added Block 5 in 1992, we've added the K Vineyard in 2001, we've added the Darshan High Density 11,000 vines per hectare vineyard in 2014 and then last year we added Block 8, another couple of acres at 11,000 vines per hectare called Block 8 and uh, the original plantings were at 2,500 vines per hectare, so that's a typically Australian way of setting up the vineyard, 3 metres, 1.2 between vines, and uh, 1,000 vines per acre or 2,500 vines per hectare. So what we've done since then is come in closer and tighter in order to get a very small yield per vine, a lot of competition between vines, and get the roots really driving deep and get uh, more shading of the soil and we hope to make a more intense and complex expression of the Bindi site. And it's important to note that all of the Bindi wines are grown and made at Bindi. It's not a brand, it's actually a place, it's a piece of geography. Yeah, cool. So, and wow, you just packed in so much information <laughs> into about 30 seconds. Um, I, I'm interested to interested to hear. I know for, for me, I've I've got a I guess a perspective of, this, of Australian Pinot that and how it's changed over time. That uh, very early on, we, we we struggled to get our heads around it and uh, how to how to make it. You know, you get one shot at experimenting a year making it, one shot a year at growing it, yeah. and uh, and there's going to be changes over that over 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 years. And in particular, what I'm finding now is. Uh, in, in general in Australia, the Pinots are more restrained, that there's a sophistication of tannin, perhaps associated with old vines, mm. and there's a, a bit more wisdom in terms of winemaking uh, resulting in wines that have got great poise. Is, is that something that you've, you've seen in Australia, and, and, and does that reflect mm. changes that might have happened at Bindi, or did you have it right from day one? Oh, well, there's a lot in that question, <laughs> if there was a lot in the last answer. So that's yeah. a really poignant um, discussion to raise at this point in, uh, in our maturity of Pinot Noir. So let's go back to the 80s and 90s when Pinot Noir was really just taking off in the Yarra Valley, Mornington Peninsula, Masson Ranges, Geelong. Yes, I acknowledge that there were some vineyards going before that, like Bannockburn, Bass Phillip, Mount Mary and so on. But very small production, you know, compared to today there was probably one hundredth of the Pinot Noir plantings back then as there is now. So. Let's go to the 80s and 90s, there were mostly young vineyards, there were philosophies around four and five tonnes to the acre, and there were many vineyards planted in the wrong location, and then people were applying winemaking techniques that were more red wine than being careful, careful handle of Pinot Noir. So we look back to then, we had problems with yield, we had problems with young vines, we had problems with winemaking and vineyards in the wrong spot to start with. And then you fast forward 25, 30 years to today, we've obviously got older vineyards, the vineyards are in the wrong spot, have been sorted out, isolated, grafted, taken up, taken out. So today we have vineyards in much better spots, we have much older vines, 
we have people understanding that you can't get four or five tonnes per acre or say 10 to 12 tonnes per hectare to make excellent Pinot Noir. So people have pulled back the expectation of yield. They're working much harder in the vineyard to get one and a half, two tonnes to the acre. And then wine making for Pinot Noir is much more sensitive, smaller batches, the experimental time on skins with small proportions of whole bunch perhaps, and not over oaking the wines and letting the perfume in the sense of great place express itself. So we are so far more advanced. And your comment about tannins, riper fruits, smaller yields, um, mature vines, picking dates being monitored carefully and very good vineyard science, all these things play a really strong role. So we've gone past this, um, this forward fruity style of Pinot Noir and tannins is one thing, very good acidity is another, concentration of fruit is, a, is another one, time on lees in barrels is another one. So we're in a period of time now where we're making wines that are so much better than they were 20 years ago. Yeah, oh, look, I, I would completely agree with that. Um, so, what does the next 20 years hold? What are you working on? What's 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 happening in the vineyards? Or what's happening in the winery? Well, we've come a long way from when we first planted and we started off in the um, Roundup era when farming was very much a way of controlling the environment. The, um, the suppliers of farm chemicals were saying, you know, this is the way you control, these are the difficulties you'll encounter and we can provide you solutions, uh, which has only been a really a 30, 40 year thing in, in modern farming. Uh, before that, people worked much harder. They used natural inputs, they had equipment that serviced their needs, they didn't rely on chemicals to control the environment. So we went from this period of starting up using um, systemic sprays and herbicide to pulling those things out. We said, well, if we mulch under vine, now we plough under vine, we can do these things, we don't need to use poisons for the soil. Instead of having quite a dense canopy, we do more shoot thinning and we didn't need to use systemic sprays, now we just use um, sulphur and copper uh, against downy powdery mildew. And we have much more airflow. and for the last 15 years we've not used any botrytis sprays because we have all this air and light going through the canopy and we don't have bunch on bunch where we have a problem with disease. Even though it's quite a cold area and late ripening often in autumn when we're getting quite a lot of moisture, we still don't suffer from botrytis. So we went through a whole lot of changes of philosophy of equipment and practices so we don't need to use chemicals of those types in the vineyard. And also that translated into the way we make the wine. We, we, we still make the wine in many of the same ways, but we don't need to use, use yeast or add yeast to the wines now, or the juice. We don't use enzymes when we press. We don't use fining agents. We don't use, use nutrients. We make the wine very carefully. We want, like wine to be fresh and vibrant, but we can achieve that with careful work and detailed work rather than using winemaking inputs to achieve that result. I love that, that call about uh, freshness and vibrancy because I, I, in the vineyards that I've seen that have perhaps converted to that uh, at the time traditional uh, agrochemical approach to to uh, growing grapes to, to an approach where they're perhaps a bit more conscious of the uh, of the soil and uh, and what can be achieved to balance a vine. Not only have you seen vitality in the vine. But it seems to have translated into vitality and vibrancy in, so in the vine, should I say, but vitality and vibrancy in the wine at the end of the day. Is that something that you've seen as well as you've, you've, you've shifted the approach? I think when you care deeply about the way you farm, it naturally translate, should translate that you care deeply about the way you look after wine. To actually draw the direct correlation, which I've seen and, and heard about quite often, that um, organic biodynamic farming provides more energy, more vibrancy and life in the wine. Um, I'm not really sure. I know that we farm in a really healthy way. It feels much better and we look at our soil as evidenced by more humus in the soil, more earthworm activity. So we know it's healthier. We see the vines responding in a way that's more resistant to diseases and we work very hard and there's that, that crossover between hard work and those good results. Um, and whether it's the absence of chemicals or the introduction of more life in the vineyard, I'm not exactly sure because there's, this, um, there's multiple factors going on. But certainly the way we look after the wine and care for the wine enhances that work we do in the vineyard or maintains that work in the vineyard and I don't like to take it so far that it sounds like a religious outcome, it sounds like some esoteric uh, spiritual outcome. I definitely know the wines have got vibrancy and energy in them um, but I don't like to lay it at the feet of a uh, spiritual philosophy in the vineyard.
Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I certainly wasn't going down the uh, organic biodynamic pathway. Just, uh, <laughs> just the point. I guess that uh, mm. a, a lot of people that are, uh, are taking a, a, an approach of that, a, a, like, similar to yours uh, has resulted in in imbalance in, in, uh, in, in the in the vineyard and 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 consequently better wines in the in the in the winery. And one, one thing I can definitely say on that is. When we see the vines being really healthy, when we see the soil in a really healthy way, friable, aerated, as I said, a lot of humus, you see earthworm activity, and you see a vine respond in quite a strong way, and they're, they're resilient vines now. We saw vines with Utica, the dieback occurring um, earlier days when the soil was under stress, and now we see the soil much healthier with compost work as well. We see vines that we thought were going to die by age 30 actually rebounding and strong and delivering one and a half, two tons of the acre now. They've actually fought back through the health of the soil rather than being debilitated. So there's no doubt those type of vines produce fruit that is more intense, more complex, and has the power to be vibrant and, and layered and delicious. So in that way, there's no doubt the wines are better and have better character and are translating through winemaking that is not um, purist necessarily, not uh, manipulative, but they, they come out very delicious and, and very vivid. And they're not wines uh, that you would say are forward and savoury because they're, uh, they're contrived to be so well because the fruit is fragile and they're sort of vulnerable to disease, well, vulnerable to winemaking folds or premature evolution. So we're definitely seeing strength in the wine from strength in the vineyard. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it all, all makes a lot of sense really. But, um one last question. Um, what for you makes good wine? <laughs> Very good fruit. I was having a conversation with someone the other day. It's unbelievably hard to make bad wine. You have to work so hard to make really average wine because it needs to be manipulated, contrived, adjusted, and that takes a hell of a lot of thought and work. To make great wine takes really good fruit, and then actually after that, it's very easy to make. Oh, good. Michael, thank you for joining us at Wine Decoded and uh, look forward to drinking more of your booze. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, mate.